about uh, Nils earlier described a book that will exist in, at some point in the future. Um, we're here talking about a book that exists now. Book. Uh, and book, yeah. And I'm to, uh, the structure is I'll present a, 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 a kind of a distorted summary of, of, of the work and make a few, ask a few questions and then the authors uh, can comment and then we should have open discussion in that order. I'll try to be brief. The book consists of some very thoughtful introductory and concluding chapters, but basically 14 case studies, case studies of markets and the organizations around them. And the whole focus of the book is the relation between market and organization. Um, the, the case studies are rather consistent so that uh, the book holds together well. The uh, integrating theme, although the authors don't really say it the right way, they have a, a common opponent. And it's basically a transaction cost. Oliver Williamson. He's the bad guy. Um, Oliver Williamson emphasized the trade-offs between in, in a stable equilibrium situation. That activities, a certain functional activity has to happen. It can be done with more markets or more uh, organization or something later on in between. Uh, basically trade-offs implying negative relation. And this book is about all the positive relationships between expanding organization and expanding markets. So the, uh, the ancestor, the most famous one would be Carl Polanyi, with an imagery of expanding market society, generating uh, social controlling organization. Uh, Polanyi saw that as a reactive process. These authors see it as much more complex than that and seeing the causal relationships going both ways. So a secondary theme of, of, of great interest to me, but of, of, in secondary in the book, is the effect of expanding organize, organization in society on the expansion of markets. And the authors understand that, that the organized society with the constantly expanding organizational structures and more and more complex functions, that generates rationalized markets internally if, as, an, as organizations incorporate more and more unreasonable things. Uh, it gets hard to articulate their functional relation to each other. And you rely very heavily uh, on exogenous uh, uh, myth structures, one of which is you have internal markets. They also, in the, along the same line, emphasize that expanded rationalized organization uh, as it has, confronts more and more stakeholders with uh, hard to interpret relations. Uh, tends to gener generate markets to rationalize and legitimate and stabilize relations. This is, um, for, for, for example, at, at, at Stanford uh, in the old days, uh, the, the, this campus has 40 square kilometers and there are a lot of raccoons around and they can make trouble. So you have the raccoon problem. And in the old days, a groundskeeper could shoot them. Well. You can't do that anymore. Now it gets more rationalized and you have to have organizational arrangements and plans. And a market arises in what used to be called pest control services. But you can't use the word pest either because the raccoons were here first. Um, so this, is this kind of example is everywhere. And it is a, a secondary theme in the, in the case studies, uh, but very much a theme. The main focus of the book 
And it's asymmetrical in the sense that it's focused on the organization that arises before and around markets. It, the focus is on market society. So the causal processes of central interest are the uh, impact of intentions to and efforts to expand markets and then all the organizational structure that arises around that. Before or after, the buyers organize. Before or after, the sellers organize. And then the market itself uh, 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 has an organizational structure. And then beyond that, there are what they call others, the, uh, the uh, wider groups in society that make normative judgments and criticism and so on. There is a, a mild normative problem in, in that uh, the authors tend to treat those others out there as because they're like us, as nice guys. And the people who organize the markets, they use the unfortunate word profiteer to describe that, which is not a, not a positive term. Uh, to describe the people who structure and control the market itself. But these are, that's a minor point, and I wouldn't worry about it. Now, the contrast with Williamson... Williamson imp uh, in the implies a kind of functional an equilibrium system. These authors are studying very dynamic processes that expand over time. They don't just change. They, the whole story is the expansion of markets, the expansion of organization. And that means that the functions arise that did not exist before that have to be either marketized or supervised in some fashion. So you get surprising kinds of market. One chapter is an ordinary market, a historical analysis of the pipe and tube industry in, in Sweden. And that's pipes and tubes are, are real things, and they have prices, and there's markets, and it, the character of the markets changes over time. Great. But then you have a chapter, the market in consulting which is what we do, which is essentially a market in nothingness. And uh, the idea is that might create even more. To do that might create more organization, since you have to specify in, in more elaborate ways the, the, the thing that is putatively being exchanged. So there are ideas of that sort. Uh, uh, and very dynamic. It's, the book is not dynamic in the sense of a broader historical analysis. It's dynamic in the sense that each of the cases, they, there's a real sense of the process by which efforts to make markets encourage or create or require organization. And that's a contemporary issue. I'm to, as critic, to, uh, given that summary, to raise questions, I have two general questions. One is unclear, and the other is even more unclear. Uh, but the clear one has several subparts. And that is, I'd ask the authors to contemplate, can they imagine any circumstances under which Williamson is right? I mean, it's not, it's not built in that, that he's always wrong. Uh, there might be conditions under which that way to think makes sense. Specifically, the, the cases in the book, they, there's a magic date, and it's the start of the neoliberal period, 1990. And most of the cases are of events that occur in the time frame of the 1990s and sometimes the 2000s. Only I mean, the, the pipe and tube paper is historical. It goes back. But the others really are, in other words, they're about a time period in which uh, massive amounts of cultural ideology encouraged uh, the pretenses of marketization. So uh, a sub-question, uh, my first question is, uh, 
would this be the same in other time periods when, the, when that exogenous pressure was not there? The exogenous pressure both to organize and to marketize. In other words, uh, how is the, the, are the findings and the observations of the book affected by its concentration on the neoliberal period? Question one, sub-question one. Sub-question two, the cases are, sw are about Sweden, which is fine. Uh, but you wonder, in reading the chapters, what would it look like in France? Uh, the Swedish uh, state never was a f like the French state, and certainly they were mad with, about marketization. One of the papers, and these are good papers, uh, uh, and by, by the way, the papers are in general funny, although it is not clear to me that the authors think that way about it. Uh, 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 but what the funniest one, maybe, is the one on accreditation, that the rise of systems of, accredit of certification require, then, accreditation bodies. And to, to legitimate those, there are larger accreditation bodies up at the national level and now at the world level. So you have an infinite regress process of trying to find God, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, by, by organizing at higher levels, con controlling it. And the authors note at one point, well, in Sweden, to some extent, the state still survives, and they slow some of this down, meaning it would be worse in the United States. So that's interesting. So that second question, how would it vary depending on the structure, wider structure of the polity? Third sub-question, some of the cases are about markets in an ordinary real sense, the pipe and tube business. But a surprising number of the cases are about the expansion of marketized society in to, to uh, unclear areas. The management of pension funds, ch ch children's insurance, uh, elder care. A surprising number of them are about these postmodern uh, uh, structures in which something unclear is under pressure to be marketized. Uh, so uh, another a question I have is now, how would these processes look different if we were talking about a real world? Potatoes and stuff, uh, as opposed to uh, elder care. Uh, uh, so surprising numbers of the papers are, and, and of course this describes the modern expansion of organization in markets, that it, now, it penetrates areas that we had not previously thought were subject to this kind of rationalization. That's a worldwide process. And that's, so that ends uh, my first meta question. And it's basically about how this might vary depending on the structural conditions the wider cultural environment in the world, the neoliberal thing, the variation in nation state structures, and the variations in the properties of the quote commodities unquote that are putatively marketized. Now I turn to my briefly in conclusion here uh, to my second question, which is less clear. Um, and I, I contemplate the hypothesis that the unclarity is not in me, but but that that might be disputable. Um, there are two radically different conceptions of organization running through the whole book. The dominant one is that list of sort of five things that might be rationally st structured by decision, which makes more organization: membership, rules, uh, sanctions, monitoring and hierarchy. Uh, I don't know where that list came from, and I have no reason to uh, accept it or reject it. But it is a, a sort of a real misconception of organization. That then runs against conception of organization as centrally decision. Part of it overlaps, that is, the decisions can be about monitoring, sanctions, and such matters. Yeah, the, the 
and Nils is quite clear about that also this morning. Uh, that part isn't a problem. The problem is that other meaning of the word decision, which implies purpose. And in this book, almost nobody has any purposes. But I think in modern society, it's saturated with people who think they're actors and have purposes. And the decisions then are about the purposes, and the rationalization of the decisions produces you know, a, a, a lot of organizational structure. So I'm puzzled by that shift, or that uh, what looks like a partial inconsistency between the, uh, and it sounds like the two parts of, uh, part of Nils Brinson's work in the 1980s are at war with each other. Uh, that is, uh, the practice goes on, the list of five things that get managed and organized and so fine. And then the decision, which is talk, talk and action. And we move back and forth between a focus on that. The dominant focus in the book is on action, not on the talk. But so the references to decision, meaning purpose and decision, you know, are ritual references to uh, good references. Lumen, obviously, March and Simon, obviously. Uh, Nils and uh, Sherston Sal and Anderson uh, in, 19, in 2000. Uh, but I kept thinking, what would the book be like if it was written from the point of view of the dream world of decision rather than the structuration of action? And that's a, an uncertain issue, but I, I do mention it. I see that as an, uh, kind of an inconsistency or at least something to puzzle about. So let me stop there. And because the uh, this book, you should focus on the book. It's a good book, and the chapters are actually very well written, and you can use them in class and stuff. So, congratulations to the authors. Yes, thank you very much for this uh, presentation with that we, we partly recognized what we had written and partly not. <laughs> so, and that's a good sign, I, I think. Um, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, 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 we, are, we are both describing the, the, the way that, that markets uh, interact with organizations and how organizations are created by markets and, and markets are created by organizations, but we also describe how they are, markets are organized by the intervention then of, of, of a lot of various uh, uh, actors uh, uh, that do that. And, and, and um, uh, um, and uh, well, I, just a, a small remark on, on this um, uh, profiteers and others. Well, we try to distinguish them because, we, as profiteers, we mean all these people who, who act in one market and try. They earn their living from organizing another market, like brokers, for instance, and, and so on. So they are actually profiting from. And we also have examples of of, of profiteers that are that are sort of um, uh, uh, not has it as a job, but but that intervene. For instance, in, in the Swedish taxi market, hotels intervene, so to speak, in order to protect their own business. And I, I think that's not uh, from a point of view of a very, very um, uh, idealistic. It, it's just about uh, making better profits in one market by organizing another market, a side market that, is, that you are dependent on. Because the markets, as we all know, are interconnected, so to speak. Um, um, so... so um, um, yeah, I, I, yeah. So this book is about mainly about one time period and one uh, country, and uh, and <coughs> so it's it's really fair to, to ask what would what would look it uh, different in different time or different um, uh, in a different uh, cultural setting. And and uh, and the thing about the Sweden is, is that it's it's. Uh, 
a society where the state is highly legitimate, but markets also highly legitimate. So, it, that, so it, it's a, maybe we have studied the max, maximum case in a way. <laughs> that, 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 um, uh, and, and I think definitely it, um, it would look different in, in, in some other countries and so on. Um, over, uh, yeah, and over time, I, well, we haven't done much of that, uh, and, uh, but, uh, uh, I mean, it's, uh, um, I mean, when, when, when um, uh, markets around 1900 and so on, they were, as you know, very much organized by cartels. I mean, that the, that the sellers, uh, uh, organized the market, and and uh, and then was a, uh, and that was a a, a a nice way to get away of of chaos and so on that that could uh, could result from from the abolishment of guilds and so on, um, but that came under more heavy criticism in in the 30s uh, 40s in Sweden uh, here earlier, and and then show up uh, other organizers they had opened up for other other organizers. And not only the state, but but also a lot of others, and that, and that's um, that's one main impression we have that that, that there are so many uh, so many that can engage in organizing markets, and and uh, it's a sort of um, 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 it's very far away from uh, our picture is sort of very far away from the the idea of that markets are essentially. Uh, systems of mutual adaptation, and sometimes the state has to intervene and, and try to. It's so much more organization and, 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 and so on. So, um, um, yeah, we, we, maybe we should show what, what kind of markets we have there because I, I'm not. Um, yeah, there are some. some uh, I, th I think that there are. Almost all kinds of market. I mean, we don't have the potato market, but we have. Uh, oh, maybe we cannot. Okay, it, it doesn't matter. But, but we were, we were rather struck by the. Maybe we, we should investigate that further. But we were rather struck by the similarities between selling uh, consulting and selling uh, jeans, which was one, one case that we didn't come into the book. But but, um, um, so. Um, Uh, I'm less sure about this about purpose, and um, I, 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 I can't really see that that we don't describe purposes. I, I mean, we. Um, that's all part of this this uh, uh, decision orientation orientation of the book, and and um, um, and uh, now. Uh, I mean, there is, there is, of course, an interesting uh, difference between talk about uh, markets and action in markets. And, and uh, well, we, I think we would try to focus on, on decisions that were act actually had something to do with actions. Um, uh, although uh, we discovered that, that, that some of, of these uh, um, decisions were not very, I mean, very legitimate because it, in the general discourse, markets shall not be organized. Well, it's always uh, has always been a problem, you know, to to, to say uh, uh, descriptive normative problems to say that they are organized. And and um, um, so so in on the sort of general discourses level, there is definitely a, di a difference between between talk and action. But uh, in the individual case, I, I think uh, um, what we describe is is really what what. Um, uh, decisions that that, uh, uh, that construct or organize markets, so to speak. Um, but you may have another take on this. Say something di different <laughs> on the same question. <laughs> no, but but uh, just to maybe add a few things. Uh, for one thing, as you can see, the markets are not perhaps ty typical of, of uh, state intervention in, in the 1990s and so on, we have more, as you say, uh, 
ordinary markets here, examples of jeans and cod and okay, ta- you're not in the book, we have some research. Yeah, but we no, but there, we have tax we have taxi, perhaps mutual funds, okay, it's it's pensions and, and so on, but but uh, I would still say that we, we, we try to speak of, of markets in general. But nevertheless, I think your, your question whether we have a bias and in what sense do, does uh, this bias sort of affect our results. Uh, one uh, answer to that could be that, that uh, the state has actually more responsibility for, the, for these markets, how they actually work. We say that one important difference between organizing uh, formal organizations and organizing markets is that uh, responsibility much more unclear in markets. But uh, some of these uh, uh, services and so on, that there are perhaps not typical in that sense, that, that there's actually more st- uh, state responsibility for, for, for such things as health care and, and, and pensions and so on. So that's one thing that, that could differ a little bit. But nevertheless, we think that these aspects of uh, um, uh, how, how centralized responsibility is or whether it's actually the opposite, being much, much more fragmented, is a really interesting thing. That we can see that when, uh, in, in, in uh, cases of market failures and, and market problems, uh, there was actually a, a blaming between important stake, between important organizers. Who's, who's, who has the responsibility for, for this market failure and for this market problem and so on? And they blame each other and no one really took uh, responsibility, uh, in contrast to, to organizations that really concentrate responsibility, There's, you have a really clear line of <coughs> uh, hierarchical line to you know who to blame and so on. So that's an interesting uh, difference. And, and I mean, we, we use the last uh, chapter of the book to really discuss these uh, uh, similarities as well as, and as we have said, there are many similarities between organizing markets and organizing formal organizations, but we also bring up uh, important differences and responsibility and the concentration of responsibilities is one of those differences. Uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have others that we, we, we uh, bring up. Um, uh, for example, that the markets has uh, can perhaps sh- show that one. Um, uh, market has less detailed constitution now I'm leaving a little bit your, your questions here, perhaps. <laughs> but nevertheless, these are really important aspects if you want to understand the organizing of, of markets in comparison to the organization of formal organizations. Um, um, we say that, that, as Niels brought up, organization has less legitimacy as an ordering form. There is still, you asked, uh, you asked us, uh, um, John, uh, whether you could say that if these changes that we have studied would be different if we have studied not the 1990s and, and so on. And I think that, that the idea of the free market is that institution is, is much stronger in this time period than whether we had chosen other, uh, other uh, the studied other times of market organization. And that means that, that uh, th- this makes organization less legitimate in this time period. So you often had to explain yourself when you would like to sort of increase the, 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 the amount and the level of organization in case of market failures and, and other market problems and so on. So that's perhaps one, one answer uh, to, to, to that question. Um, uh, and then we also say that, um, let's continue, that it's really interesting that you can see also in times of market problems and, and market uh, failures that Still, the organization was the main uh, um, answer. Even though you had less legitimacy for organizing markets, you still, there was a, 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 a really great amount of organization brought in in those times. So you really had a lot of organization and reorganization because of the effects wasn't uh, always uh, uh, the intended one. Uh, but in those cases, we also saw another important and interesting difference is that you had uh, considerably fewer organizational recipes and consultants and guru, gurus, etc. If you, if compared to, to the problems of formal organization, to, to the problems of markets, it was really interesting to see. Uh, so there was not at all that kind of market supply <laughs> in those kind of uh, uh, critical situations. And that's another, perhaps the fourth uh, 
interesting difference. Yes. So I don't know if we calculate it. Yeah. We should open up. Yeah. Uh, Lars Engvall, Uppsala University. I belong to an older generation where we were taught about the contingency theory that uh, organizations, uh, they were organized uh, differently depending on what kind of a task they have. Uh, could you see something uh, similarly here that, that because uh, the different products or the markets you, you uh, list there, they, they, they seem to be uh, a bit heterogeneous. Uh, so, so, was there any indication that, that uh, markets were organized in another way depending on, on what, what they were supplying? Uh, okay. Uh, no, we are weak on that point, I, th I think. We, uh, and because we are sort of concentrating on the processes uh, by we and and of course uh, <coughs> there has been speculations in, you know about this that, that a certain order is in a certain kind of market and so on and we in a way we we reframed actively from from going into that discussion and because we wanted to see the processes I instead um, <coughs> but uh, um, um, but we, of course, uh, as uh, as perhaps John was indicating, I mean, it's it's uh, uh, it, it may be a, a, a problem that that uh, this um, this market. I mean, it may may sort of fit better to to potatoes. Uh, some of the thinking of markets fits better to potatoes markets. Then it became complicated, more complicated when 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 this reasoning is applied to to. Um, to uh, elder care or something like that, of course, and we try to um, to uh, to uh, describe that and and um, 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 uh, so um, there is a little bit of it in in, in the book, but but not uh, not too much. I haven't had the benefit of reading the book, so asking questions is a, is, is a funny operation. But um, <laughs> but that's the moment. So our, I wonder if you if in the book you make a distinction between markets organizations and market organizations. So it seems like there would be three types: a market at one end, a sort of a state-like organization at the other end, and then an organization that's set up to function in the marketplace. And I I wonder if that sort of uh, three-way yeah, yeah. But this, uh, the distinction we, we, we make is, uh, I think, more, more of a, uh, that that markets can be be, be organized. Uh, you call it internal markets. Markets can be organized within a formal organization, and and that much, much of economic theory is uh, is built on that uh, that by, by these uh, order studies of the Parisian exchanges and so on. You know, they are actually studying formal organizations and. <laughs> And uh, how they organize, but uh, but we didn't take up that here because because we thought that's that's less interesting from organization theory point of view that you can organize if you have all the uh, all the elements of for formal organization in your hand, and then you can organize a market that that functions as you want it to function, and 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 actually uh, more uh, economists. Uh, um, uh, say so that if, if you want to have a perf something like a perfect market, you have to put it in a formal organization and ma make an exchange of it. And, but the other markets are, are <coughs> different. So our point is more to the point that also the other markets are, organ are organized, uh, and not only this. And, and um, um, uh, so, so I think that's the distinction we make: but mar markets, uh, formal organizations, and formal organizations having markets within themselves, so to speak. And, and we sort of don't go too much into that because we, uh, because we, we think this is more interesting, uh, uh, the organization of, of sort of other kinds of markets. And, uh, and um, as economists admit, I mean, 
it's it's very difficult to 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 if to create something that that becomes more like a perfect market and so on because there are so many so many organizers here uh, they have different element uh, different uh, instruments in their hands and they are conflicting and and, and argue and and uh, have opposite interests and so on. So, so, so it, it easily creates uh, 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 very, very much dynamics here, and, and, and very seldom something close to to, um, to, to a perfect market. Maybe I could add that that uh, I think it's really interesting we, as we discuss three the three basic ordering forms of markets are being mutual adaptation institutions and organization and I think it's a good question to really investigate uh, and I mean this could this could look very differently there are many in the perf performativity literature of course <coughs> claiming that the institutional uh, explanation of, of, of individual markets it's it's quite homogeneous but but I think what we we're, we we're much more delivering a, a nuanced picture here, that there are differences also when it comes to institutions, of, and of course there are many possible differences when it comes to organization, what elements are used and what amount of each element and so on, and, and also when it comes to mutual adaptation. So, so I think this is a quite uh, well-functioning uh, model for analyzing markets in, in different em environments, and you can find many differences, but, but we see the uh, imported similar patterns still. So, uh, so from our sake, we, we, we believe in the general concepts of... of, of uh, I mean, these are the same processes that are used, of course, for, for understanding uh, uh, formal organizations. And we also discussed uh, the interrelationship between uh, mutual adaptation institutions and organizations. So we, we find both explanation to organization, market organization, of course, in mutual adaptation and, and, and institution, but we also see how, of course, the, the other way around, how market organization affect mutual adaptation, the daily practice of, of markets and in, in different ways, and, and also actually uh, uh, institutions. We saw processes of organizing markets that led to deinstitutionalization of, of uh, formally strong uh, market ideas, for example. So, so I think it's, it's, we would really see <laughs> more studies of how markets are organized. That's an important thing that we, uh, as this being an example of organization outside formal organizations, where nevertheless we can apply very many of the organizational concepts and the theories for, because there are so many similarities between markets and, and formal organizations. So that's one basic message from the book. Uh, I also didn't have the benefit to to read the book, but I was wondering. Sometimes I had the impression that the market category, the market word, is used in many different ways, and uh, I was wondering what's the difference in your approach between market and industries or sectors, economic sectors, and uh, also I was wondering uh, if you had anything, any comments to, sh to share about. Uh, the the role of the price system to organize the market. I didn't hear the last question. Oh, the last question. I was also wondering if you have any thoughts to share on the role of the price system to organize the market. I think that's an important the price yeah system. I think it's an important topic if you want to you know discuss with economists and so on. Um. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, yeah. We we define markets as as, as um, systems of exchange under competition, and then when we deal, we don't have a very um, uh, sophisticated way then of delineating uh, markets. But as we saw from this list, uh, we use this uh, usual way of basing. Uh, the additional market on the products that, that, that are, are sold. So I, I don't think it, it differs much for, from, um, 
from uh, that. Uh, what, we, what we don't do is, is to uh, treat markets as an ideal type or something like that. Uh, we use both markets and formal organizations we look upon as empirical phenomena uh, that they are worth analyzing, so to speak, and, and we don't mix them up with, with, uh, with uh, types. So, uh, uh, what about price systems? And, and, and uh, yeah, well, now we, we are sort of focusing then on, on what, uh, it's not only what kind of organizational elements are they using, but also what aspects of markets do they, or do, do they interfere with? What they, they, do they interfere with the products or, or with the sellers or with the buyers or, or with the prices sometimes, you know, and, 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 and try to control um, those things and try to organize those things. And it varies in very, very markets. Various markets, that um, uh, of course, and and uh, um, so um, yeah, but but I, I mean, generally, I, I would say that that we, we I mean, it has a, it's a very old observation. I mean, a hundred years old at least. You know that markets are organized. The economists have said that all the time, <laughs> but they have they have not very clearly specified. <laughs> Well, what, what shall we mean by, by the organization of market? Well, they have specified these exchange, <coughs> exchanges, you know, in, in, um, and so on. But, but this kind of markets, in, in what way can we understand them as, as organized? And, and if we do that, we can, as Matt said, we can start comparing them with the organizations and, 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 um, and, and also see how they, of course, develop together and how they, how they are dependent on each other. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, uh, and the dynamics of that. So that's, I think, the message in the book. Ah, there were some more questions. Okay. So thanks very much for your comments. Can you hear me? Yeah. So thanks very much, Mark Ventresca. I appreciate the talk and really sympathetic to the idea of bringing kind of organizational tools to understand markets and the ordering of markets. Kind of with John's comment, with your earlier comment today, Niels, I'm also curious, at the same time, the same year that uh, Oliver Williamson got the Nobel Prize, Lynn Ostrom got the Nobel Prize for also trying to help us understand, in a sense, to break the kind of markets and hierarchy story yeah. and to begin to reimagine communities, intermediaries, yes. networks, and so forth. Um, a lot of the cases you cited uh, are cases of public goods, common goods, uh, child care, elderly populations. I'm wondering if what you've thought or if you've thought at all about sort of what the Ostrom approach, in the same way pivoting governance and organization, pivoting governance and market, yeah. uh, if the Ostrom approach would help us enrich what you're saying in this book for the next book, or if you have a view on the Ostrom kind of contribution. Um, yeah, actually, actually we, are, we are using Ostrom. Uh, I mean, uh, she has... The same idea about, well, she doesn't call it organization, she calls it institutions and so, and so on. But, but what, she, what she's interested in, interested in is how, in my terms at least, is, is how, how common, um, what is it, common, this common thing, yeah, <laughs> is, is, is organized in, in different ways in, over thousands of years and, and in different areas of the world. So, so actually, our, uh, John was a little sort of, <laughs> um, uh, skeptical about this, um, uh, you know, membership and hierarchy and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, but uh, but that, that's the same categories actually that Ostrom is using, uh, and uh, doesn't make them better in, in any way. I don't mean that. But I, but, but still, we, we are building on, on on those studies, and that we had brought into this uh, 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 because we think they can be used in in a wider settings than Ostrom were. Studying, but it's an interesting remark you have that they're the same. Yeah, that William saw and they got. I've never thought of that before. That is really <laughs> cute. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes, if there's no final question, we'll, we'll close at this point and we start at one o'clock. Uh, panel number three. Panel number two. Panel number three. <coughs>